Okay, you're on. Yeah, we're on. Okay. Um, good morning, this is Bruce, and uh, I'm in uh, uh, Mike Moore's uh, shop, his uh, garage at uh, <laughs> home in Torrance, in California, and um, Mike uh, specializes in um, repairing bells, or what they call uh, 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 horns, for, um, for locomotives, and he's got some very unique pieces of equipment here as well. Um, so we'll, I'll turn it over to Mike. Okay. Um, and uh, thank you for oh. allowing me to come here. Well, Bruce, and, that's a, you made a long uh, trip to come out here just to see this humble shop. So yeah. uh, <laughs> I hope it's uh, you know meets your expectations. <laughs> uh, so yes, yeah, so if you so you can walk us through a little bit and just give us a brief on on some of your equipment and uh, okay well we'll just go are, real yeah. real quickly uh, I have a pretty basic stuff uh, especially compared to some of you guys out there but I have a Lagoon FTV1 uh, milling machine it's a CNC retrofit uh, servo 2 uh, it's pretty obsolete in terms of its technology uh, for a CNC capability but it's got a very user-friendly interface and it works very well for doing what I need it to do uh, it can also be run in a manual mode, and it's a little heavier duty than the standard uh, Bridgeport uh, milling machine. So you can see it's a pretty heavy ram. So it, it takes a reasonable cut. So I, I really like this uh, this milling machine. Highly recommend Lagoon product if uh, anybody's considering something and is not totally stuck on getting a Bridgeport, which is kind of nice too because it's you know USA made and so forth. So um, this is not, but. Uh, Right here, uh, we can you know, put our focus on, this is a Sydney lathe, and it was made in the same city as Monarch, uh, Sydney, Ohio, uh, is where it originated from. This particular lathe was uh, built in 1944. Um, it uh, was originally sold to the U.S. Navy, according to the stamps on the ways that I can see. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, extremely heavy duty and durable machine and uh, it's already lasted in excess of 70 years and, and I expect it will outlast me at this rate, especially with uh, you know the light duty type of uh, machine work that I do on it. Um, right in the foreground is just my, my uh, little welding table which is portable. I can fold it out and, or fold it up when I'm, I'm not using it. Um, you know, I'm trying to cram as much uh, capability in the small shop as I can. So that's, you know, what I have to, you know, set up for my welding. And over here is my original lathe I bought something like 30 years ago. It's a South Bend Model 10K. Swings 10 inches. Some people call it a light 10. Um, it's uh, in pretty decent shape. It's probably an old school machine at one time, but uh, it's uh, well maintained and I use that for mainly doing smaller parts and uh, smaller repairs on horns. If I got one set up in the big lathe, I don't want to change it. I can come over here and, uh, uh, you know, do the small work on this machine. And I have a lot of tooling for it. It's well tooled. Uh, welding equipment, I've got a Miller uh, TIG welder. Um, it's uh, what I started with. Um, it's so it's a small unit. It's only up to good up to about 180 amps. Uh, so that's probably going to be the next thing I'm looking to upgrade in the shop um, because uh, a lot of the work I have to do is uh, dealing with aluminum castings, and aluminum takes a lot of current. And uh, 180 amps at 10% duty cycle won't cut it for the thicker pieces. So, okay. do you, do you come across any aluminum work that you do? Oh, to lots do? of uh, most of the uh, railroad air horns are uh, made out of aluminum castings of one sort or another, and a lot of the um, you know repair work uh, is fixing either cracks or broken castings, broken horn bells. So. Um, you know, so if you want to fix something like a manifold, you've got cross sections up to half an inch thick, typically. You so need to grunt. You need uh, probably 280 amps or so uh, would be a good one to get. So oh, absolutely. Something in that uh, kind of um, capacity range. Um, so, and then over there, I've got some grinders and some other things, and, and that's sort of the uh, you know junk part of the shop. There's not too much to see over there, but uh, you can see the back side of the lathe for sure. And um, most of uh, you know my work that I do is uh, you know I do a lot of different kinds of things. It's kind of general job shop work, but a lot of my work it has to do with a repair of railroad air horns. Uh, I got into that many years ago because I've always been a railroad enthusiast, 
and uh, you know at the time I had kids they couldn't get out to the tracks to chase trains around and I thought gee I'd like to get a horn just to have and you know one horn led to more horns led to a whole community of uh, horn enthusiasts and uh, you know needing repairs and having some machine shop skills have worked out pretty well for everyone so that's in a nutshell um, what my shop is about so yeah, so maybe we can um, just quickly, and I see you've got, a, you've got plenty, as you said, you've got plenty of um, tooling for this lathe. It's a beautiful little lathe. It's a yeah, um, really, of, really nice lathe. It's, uh, lots of tooling. Uh, I, I didn't do any, like, uh, clean up on the shop before this, so there's lots of clutter, uh, lots of different things. There's a dividing head that I, you know, comes out once in a while to do some things. Uh, I saw you were doing some gear cutting, so that would be very useful in a job like that. I haven't had to make any gears, though, recently, <laughs> or ever. <laughs> I'd like to learn how. You've got the closer, you've got a couple of closers. Yeah, this yeah. is a, a lever action collet closer for uh, five C collets for the Sydney lathe, so yeah, that one's that's kind of... A, yeah. Uh, it's a D14 or D16. D16, yeah. Yeah, it's a D16 mount for that one. This is kind of nice. I also have, uh, you know, a short a Shogren speed chuck for 5C collets as well if I want to use that. This one's nice if you're doing a lot of repetitive work because you don't have to stop the spindle. You can use the lever, pull the bar, yeah. lock it back in. So it's kind of nice for that. Um, the other equipment here, this thing is a kiln. This is my wife's for doing, you know, ceramic work. She's a school teacher, so uh, they don't have any uh, kilns over at her school, so I end up doing all the firing for her. So that's basically it. Uh, you're, you're going to be putting the heavier duty. Um, yeah, this uh, is a this is a CA tool post, which is more appropriate to the size of this lathe. Um, the, CXA that I've got on here currently is a holdover from an earlier machine that I had, but I had so many tool holders I did not want to give it up, so I just adapted the height and also made a longer, you know, screw for it. So uh, anyway, so that's uh, yeah. Well, we could. I think we could. Uh, this is probably a prized possession in the in the, in the, in his shop. And what was unique about these machines were they're very heavy duty, and they got a very very wide. Um, uh, gap and a uh, very wide um, uh, distance between the ways um, and and also in the length of the saddle which is quite uh, quite long and they've got quite a long travel as well across and at the back we've got a um, a very long taper attachment it's probably twice the length or operative length of a normal uh, taper attachment which you would find in any normal workshop. <coughs> the um, yeah, uh, uh, the tail stock's quite heavy, and it's only a, it's only a more three, isn't it? That's uh, uh, that's a, a, a MT4. Four. Four, mm -hmm. it's a four. Well, that's mm -hmm. excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he's got he's got this system like I've got uh, mine. Mine is round, of course, but and it's so so handy to have these tools um, at the uh, at the back there. And um, so down here. Is a is a bit of a test bench. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, this is just this is just a surge tank off of my main compressor, but it's what I use when I'm tuning a horn bell to a particular note. Uh, I'll go back and forth between the milling machine if I'm you know pocketing it out to lower the pitch, and then I'll put it on this test stand, and then blow the horn and and use uh, either tuning software with um, uh, in my cell phone or uh, you know like a guitar tuner to measure the actual fundamental frequency that the horn is blowing. So a lot of the customers want their horns tuned up to the actual advertised chords that the horns were supposed to blow, but the production horns never actually blew the advertised chords. They're always off in pitch. So that's uh, a lot of the work uh, for collectors uh, like to do that. A lot of the other work I do uh, is just straight restoration work, machine work to restore it back to you know the original operating specifications. Um, so for private collectors as well as like railroad museums and short lines and things like that. So obviously this is a really good thing to have in the workshop for blowing the cobwebs out. That's true. Yeah, it, it uh, <laughs> rattled a few things down out of the rafters and uh, <laughs> but, uh, I think I use it as termite is that, control. Could, would you be able to give that a bit of a blast here or, yeah, I can, I can it, or do Sunday that. is a bad day for well, it? Let's, well, let's, let's, let's just give it a quick one here.
<laughs> it's pretty loud. I should have warned you about that. Sorry about that. <laughs> and I got my hearing aids in. Oh. <laughs> the situation. <laughs> but normally, uh, you know, if you're going to do any extensive amount of testing, you have to wear uh, uh, hearing protection. So I, I keep the earplugs and the earmuffs then, around then for you that. Can't, you can't hear the neighbor's cat screaming. Right. So this is just a single note. Uh, this is obviously combined on a manifold uh, with other uh, horn bells of different pitches to create the musical chords that the horns were designed to to blow mm -hmm. so a lot of people think that horns uh train horns or are, are just noise makers but that's not true they're actually you know patterned after musical instruments you know the actual blow musical chords yep. so typically american uh train horns blow major chords and canadian train horns always blew minor chords yep. so we quickly because we're, we're running out of time uh would you like to show us just what what the horn looks like in uh, yeah, the, in, the, in the working this, part of it. This yeah. is an example of one of the horns that I blew. This one's uh, actually shorter than the one I just demonstrated. And that would um, be so part of a, the manifold, right? So you you'd, uh, so you really you'd have two or three or four horns or five horns even, and they'd all be different sizes. Correct. Yeah. And then they blow different pitches. This one's obviously much shorter, so it blows a much higher pitch. So I've already taken the bolts out of the back cap, so this comes off. Diaphragm assembly is here. It's three pieces, um, two discs, uh, 18 thousandths thick stainless steel. Some people think a horn is, might be a plastic or rubber diaphragm. These are very heavy duty industrial warning devices. It's separated by a silicone, what they call a cushion ring. And this diaphragm assembly then inserts into the back cap of the horn with a controlled dimension in between the flange and this uh, shelf here that it sits on. So you drop the pieces in. And then that forms the diaphragm stack. Inside the horn bell, I've already taken out the screws. This is a diffuser plate. The air comes in through the base where it's bolted on the manifold, through a cross-drilled hole, and then in to act against the diaphragm to blow it away from this nozzle ring. Air exits out this port through the horn bell. And depending on the length of the air column, that determines the frequency that that diaphragm will oscillate at. So that's a quick introduction to air horn technology, which is pretty they, old. When, when, when they arrive at your place, they're not pristine, clean inside like that. In fact, you've no. got to do a bit of heavy duty uh, work to, uh, to prize these pieces apart, Correct. don't you? Yeah. Well, this one's in not too bad a shape. This one hasn't been remachined, uh, but many times these surfaces are so worn out, the bell becomes inoperable. So part of the restoration process is to recut all of these surfaces back to factory specifications so that the diaphragm is properly tensioned and, and the horn works properly. This one has been remachined, the one I just demonstrated, and you could tell it was quite healthy from, yeah. the, from the sound. <laughs> I'd love to pull the bloody lever. So. <laughs> we'll do it off camera. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Well, we'll get to see how your uh, 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 camera puts up with loud sounds to see if it comes out distorted it's or clear. Put, yeah, that's, we'll, we'll check that out. Um, well, that's, so it's a good that's, test. Yeah, it's a very good test and, uh, and very interesting. And uh, uh, what can I say? I'm, I'm really impressed. I, I like your work. and. Um, I might also add that, uh, and I'll say there, that part of uh, Michael's work when he when he gets these things is the corrosion. Everything he does, a lot of getter outs. He's, he probably does as many getter outs in a month than I do. Um, of having to get all these, you know, the, all the, most of the bolts are seized. I learned, every, I learned everything from Bruce. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's the power of the internet. <laughs> so, um, so you've got a lot of broken bolts and oh, a yeah. lot of uh, seized uh, studs that you drill out all the time. and. Um, so he does that on a regular basis. Yeah, that's a lot of the repair work. Yeah. And it, it happens all the time because they, they, you know, these are aluminum and then the fasteners are steel, so you have a lot of electrolysis that goes on causing corrosion. And the manufacturers uh, have never seen, they've never heard of anti-seize. <laughs> so, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. Uh, so, which would prevent that, but uh, they're always seized together. Uh, very common. Well, thank you very much for letting us in. You're and, welcome. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you at the bash. Oh yes, uh, I, I registered. Actually Stan had to remind me, but I'm in. <laughs> oh, very good, yeah, very good. Okay, well thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, we'll, um, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Okay, you bet. Thank you.